sabbe satta bhavantu sukitatta may everyone find their existential bliss may all the beings find their existential bliss uh, so this is the second day of the uh, corona related issue discussion and uh, we have been uh, covering some ground uh, the last week and uh, we are also on a uh, sort of a structured program uh, we were trying to look at uh, the issues related to corona issues like boredom freedom taken away building stress and uncertainty fear of sick sickness etc and then we also divided these uh, issues into few categories three categories compulsion fear and non acceptance and uh, we have been covering mostly on compulsion and today let's uh, get deeper into that because we couldn't finish it the last week uh, so let's get deeper into that and see um, what kind of uh, compulsive issues that we have and how a monk could tackle it so to start with um, let me tell you that uh, we grow as kids to become elders and to become uh, old and during each part of our transition during each part of la- our life we consider uh, or we give focus on various things like for example a kid who's uh, 7 8 9 10 15 uh, years old would focus primarily on his education or at least uh, it's probably not the kid but the parents or the peers or the society in general would want the kid uh, to consider education so during that period the kid uh, puts a lot of effort in uh, education and uh, uh, he stresses a lot and he gets stressed a lot in, in countries like sri lanka india you find the kids getting uh, stressed a lot uh, because they have to work hard so when this kid uh, uh, grows to become an adult uh, what is more important would be finding a job and then uh, how that kid how that uh, person is successful in his first job so during that part of your life you focus a lot on uh, your career um, and then there comes a time when you are a little senior it will be about your power like how much power do you have in that company uh, what type of a uh, status you maintain starting from your uh, vehicle from your house uh, to the title that you own so during that part you will be focusing primarily on power and then you'll be working so hard on it and then there will there will come a time where you are looking at uh, your uh, i mean uh, there will be coming a time when you are above 40 or above uh, 45 50 uh, your primary focus would be how to be uh, healthy because your cholesterol levels and your diabetic levels uh, go up your sugar levels go up and then uh, your primary objective would be how to become healthy and if if especially if you are a, a lady sometimes you consider how do i stop my aging how do i use this uh, anti aging and then uh, how do i uh, keep my face wrinkle free so there comes a the time where you are focusing on health and uh, a little later after 70 maybe 80 uh, 90 your primary focus or what you consider the most valuable is not uh, uh, education not career not power not health but it's really the time that you have left what i wanted to stress you is that during each of this period that you uh, when you are a kid you are focused on education and there's a big uh, uh, rat race on that uh, there's a lot of work done uh, around education and then uh, especially when you are a uh, adult you focus a lot on uh, career and uh, you spend a lot of time on career and then uh, on power and health but eventually when you move to the next stage for example you see that uh, the person who gets the best job is not the person who's uh, most educated if you look at uh, globally the top 100 billionaires list uh, most of them are dropouts and the people who have gotten phd's mbas they are not the ones who are earning the most and even countries like sri lanka you see sometimes it's not totally based on meritocracy but it's sometimes based on uh, what connections you have and uh, have you have uh, gotten there so all this effort you put on education it doesn't uh, sort of reflect i mean uh, the amount of uh, stress that you have to undergo uh, it doesn't reflect or it doesn't translate when you start your career and all that uh, effort that you put in your early career uh, does not necessarily translate uh, in your mid career when you are a senior manager sometimes it's again not based on meritocracy it's based on how well you play the politics how uh, 
how it just uh, happens to be. So you will find that all that effort you put during, during uh, the early stages of career doesn't necessarily translate like that. And during the more later stages, your retirement stage, you will see that uh, you have been working hard, uh, trying to maintain a lot of power, and then uh, trying to do a lot of uh, maybe not so uh, nice things that you would have ideally done, not very kind things uh, to maintain your power. All that you did would not give you an extra um, day of good health because you can't stop aging, you can't stop your uh, organs deteriorating, um, your cholesterol levels, your blood uh, sugar levels, they keep going up. And then a lot of people uh, come across, uh, if you are uh, not so fortunate, come across a lot of issues like uh, kidneys, cancers, et cetera, et cetera. You name it, there's everything. And now there's Corona on top of it. So all that uh, effort that you put on career, education, power does not matter when it comes to health at that age. And there's another age where you could only uh, move in a uh, two meter by two meter room, or that's the only space you could move, or you need a walker, or you are bedridden. So all that uh, houses that you built, all the power that you maintained, does not really matter at that stage. Don't again uh, misunderstand. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that you should not focus on education, career, health, when it matters. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that uh, during the time that you have been putting a lot of pressure on yourself, putting a pressure on the others and not being considerate about the uh, society in general, the environment, your loved ones, all that effort that you put, does it necessarily translate uh, to become useful when it comes to the next stage? Again, uh, please do not misunderstand. I'm not saying for you to be uh, demotivated. But what I'm saying is that what's the true purpose of uh, doing all this? In fact, I find that uh, this century or this, uh, this uh, year, 2020, we have been very lucky in a way because Corona or the, the COVID virus, it uh, automatically grounded us. Uh, when I say grounded, it's not like an annual leave. Everyone is on leave. So there's no point of uh, turning on, on your computer because everyone is on leave. The supply chain is down, everything is down. So there's nothing. At least I'm talking about the early parts of uh, COVID lockdown. So Corona actually gave you a chance to think about your purpose. Now I worked all this time. I studied all this time. I was uh, doing all this office politics and uh, all things possible under the sun and moon to uh, retain my power. But what did I really gain? Or uh, was it worth it? Now, I've been uh, trying to live a happy life. Uh, is that what I have been achieving? So it was a really good force that uh, the world gave it to you, the universe gave it to you as a, as a reminder probably that you should stop a little, get out of this rat race and think for yourself, what are we really doing? So let me ask you that question. Uh, what are we really doing? What is our true purpose of life? And uh, if, if I may ask the question, why do you exist? What's the purpose of this existence? What does really matter? One would say, uh, well, I live because there's uh, responsibilities. Um, I live because I'm just uh, there. You know, I was born, so I'm living. Uh, that would be a common answer. But then again, at each stage, if you look at it, education, career, power, uh, the health, the period where you need health, where you start your uh, start wearing a Fitbit, and when you start uh, going to the yoga class and start reducing on the uh, carb carbohydrates and looking at what you eat, and that time when you just hope that there's more time, what do we really look for? Maybe we need to be uh, fulfilled of something. Maybe we need to be happy or we need to associate things so that we can get entertained. But let's see, especially when you are young and when you, are old, uh, when you, when you grow old, things change. For example, um, if you take a really young kid who's about uh, 10 years of age uh, or even younger and uh, old person, Who's, who's retired and at home, or a monk, you will see that the common thing with uh, these three categories is that they have no plan. A young kid who's not still uh, attending uh, school uh, or at least doing uh, distant learning, or, or an adult 
would not have a plan in their life. Same goes to a monk. There's no plan. There's no future, basically. Uh, we don't have to think about a future. And why is that? For a kid, he's so free. He doesn't have to worry about anything. Parents are providing for everything. Uh, he's probably ignorant of the fact that the future holds for him. Or he doesn't uh, care too much because uh, it doesn't concern him uh, very much. And for an old person, although he would like to think he's incapacitated, he knows that uh, no matter what I do, I am out of resources. I cannot get my uh, energy. I cannot get my eyesight. I cannot get my hearing. Um, all I can do is accept and then uh, stay as it is. But what about a monk? A monk is not uh, ignorant because he's an adult. A monk is not incapacitated. And then why is a monk uh, living with a, without a plan? Unattached, people say. But let's see what is being unattached. Is a uh, monk uh, dropping his plans and uh, living a life without, plan, without a plan because he's, uh, he's, because he's depressed, because uh, he doesn't want to live anymore? Or is it uh, because of a fanatic reason that, uh, you know, sometimes people can get uh, a little fanatic over a course. Uh, religion, I find sometimes makes people fanatic easily. So is it that why a monk uh, lives without a plan? Now, again, uh, don't misunderstand. I'm not giving you a negative message that you should not live without a plan. Uh, of course, when we work uh, in a daily life, we do have a plan, for example, uh, although I say I did not have a plan, I had a plan to come and uh, meet you today on every Saturday evening. So there is a plan. But uh, if you look at long term, I do not have a plan as a monk. Now, let me tell you an interesting story about uh, how I got ordained. Uh, getting ordained uh, as a monk is not only about changing to a different uh, piece of garment. It's about changing your mindset, really. It's about uh, detaching from your... Uh, secular life bonds and uh, opting for a path which is non-secular. So I remember the, uh, the time that uh, when I was uh, getting ordained, so I was staying at this temple for about a month before I, uh, get, uh, before I got ordained and uh, the senior monks were proposing a name for me uh, that you have to change your monk name from your previous lay name. So they were proposing a, a name for me, the senior monks who were resident here. And they were saying, uh, let's go with this name uh, called Kottita. And then uh, I was uh, there getting ordained on the, on, in the morning. So there's this uh, ritual where you uh, shave your uh, hair and uh, make yourself totally bald, fully shaven. Uh, so during that uh, ceremony or the ritual, uh, the head monk, my uh, teacher, he approached and said, uh, so what's the name that you are proposing for this uh, new, new monk? Then the senior monk said, uh, let's uh, call him Kortita. And then the head monk was thinking, well, Kortita doesn't sound nice. Let's uh, give him Ananda. Just like that. And I felt in that moment how that I have left everything, including my identity, totally gone. You know, I was... Uh, thinking that my name would be this from my lay name, but in a matter of time, it changed completely to a totally unknown name. So I felt that it's a fantastic uh, opportunity to feel how impermanent things are and how uh, how things hang on someone else's, uh, how things hang on thread and on in someone else's hand, how it hangs on the universe, how it's not uh, totally under your control. And for that moment, you see that, uh, for that moment, I saw how detached I got from uh, being a lay person, not only in terms of uh, your shaven head or in terms of your robe, but in terms of uh, how you think. So that is how a monk uh, becomes unattached. But again, let me reiterate that uh, getting detached is not about getting depressed or getting ordained for some fanatic reason. But uh, we, if we look at how people get detached, let me take an example. Now, every one of you, sometimes when, uh, when there's summer, you go to beach with your kids, right? And the kids start uh, making sand castles. Uh, they, they play a lot. And uh, one thing that they do is make beautiful sand ca castles. 
In fact, I see that uh, there's this island uh, in the uh, Philippines called Boracay. They make beautiful, there, there's actually an annual uh, contest where they make beautiful sandcastles. And I see that every time, each year, they make a sandcastle better than the previous year. But what I also notice is that at the same place, uh, one year you make the sandcastle and the next year it's gone. There's a new castle. It's much better looking, but it's a new castle. If you look at uh, how kids and adults play on the beach, adults of course don't play, but they just uh, watch the kids. But uh, when a kid is uh, making a sandcastle, uh, the kid is so into the making of sandcastle uh, and he tries, he or she tries to make it so beautiful, look nice. But all of a sudden you see that there's a wave a little bigger than usual, which comes and uh, totally swipes off the entire sandcastle. Now the young kid is sad. He starts crying. And as the adult, as the parent, you are there, uh, you try to console the kid. Uh, see, son, uh, don't, uh, don't, try, uh, don't cry too much. That's the nature of things. It happens. Let's build another sandcastle. That's what you would say. So when it comes to our daily plans, now COVID has disturbed many of our plans. But uh, we, don't, uh, we don't really look at our life as a castle, a sand castle we don't built on a shore, on a sandy beach. We don't look, look at it that way. Like the adults who are on the shore with the kid, they don't get upset about the sand castle being washed away, wiped away. Uh, and the kid who's uh, weeping over the lost sand castle, as adults, we are weeping over our lost sand castles, which are which are fabrications on a very impermanent show. And again, if you look at why an adult wouldn't cry, because the adult knows, adult knows that uh, it's the nature of things. Apart from uh, knowing the nature, he also accepts the fact that uh, it is the way it is, uh, that uh, sand castles, they tend to wash, get washed away. So, this is how adults move on and uh, the kids weep. So getting back uh, to detachment, we see how an adult still building a sandcastle is still detached from uh, building a sandcastle, but he builds a beautiful one, like the sandcastle they create for the contest in Boracay Island. Fantastic. And I also see every time that uh, uh, the monks here in this temple, they sweep this uh, premises. We have a lot of bamboo trees and there's a lot of bamboo leaves. Every day, every evening, twice a day, uh, the monks and the residents sweep the temple. And every time the, the bamboo leaves are covering the premises, fr front yard and the backyard, no one is complaining. No one is angry of the bamboo trees. They just sweep because they accept it as it is. And the residents and the monks, they are not too attached to the beautified premises. They know that beautified premises can eventually change. So change is something uh, which we can't stop, which is inevitable. So as long as you understand that change is something inevitable, you can probably get detached. But let's uh, hold, hold on for that thought. Let's uh, keep a pause on that thought. Let's uh, get into detachment, uh, how a monk is detached and monk lives without a plan. Uh, before going there, let me uh, catch up a little with uh, what we have been covering the other day, last week. I was talking about uh, <clears throat> how, our, how, how our thoughts are chained. For example, if I ask you to think of a demon, a devil, or a ghost right now, make a create a mental image, you would think about uh, different types of image right now. You would think of a scary one, you would think of a funny one, or you would think someone uh, cute like Casper, the friendly ghost. You would think of something. But you will see that uh, the image that you can create for yourself, uh, the image that you will create for yourself will be either human-like or will be an animal-like or will be something, a hybrid of that. But you would never think of a ghost who's like a, uh, who's like a say, a, a computer webcam or a pen or a microphone. Why is that? Because uh, although we think that we are free to think of anything, actually we can't think like that. 
we can't think anything that we like, but we can think of uh, things that we are designed to think. Um, another way to look at it is like, uh, sometimes in Sri Lanka, you see that there are cows uh, who are who have been tied, they are grazing, and uh, they are tied with a little long rope, and the cow grazes thinking that he has absolute freedom. But to see that although cow thinks that there's a lot of freedom, he can only graze to the, to the length or to the uh, radius that the rope allows you to roam around. So although cow thinks he's uh, free to graze anywhere, he's not. He can only uh, go around, move about during that, uh, during that area which he's been tied to. So although we think our thoughts are totally free, we, we think that it's a free flowing thought. We can think of anything, absolutely anything, actually to see that our thoughts are not so, that uh, we are chained by certain limitations. And I will uh, tell you about another nice story about the Zen monk and the teacher or the, uh, te the Zen teacher and the student. Uh, I'm sure most of you have heard about this story, but if, if you haven't, so there was this uh, Zen teacher, Zen master who was, uh, who was enlightened and who was supposed to be very wise. So one day, <clears throat> one, day a teach, uh, one day a student approached, this student is highly qualified. He has uh, done a lot of degrees. So he wanted to gain wisdom from this teacher, from the master. So he came and said, master, will you teach me your wisdom? Um, the, the master said, sure, let's take a, uh, let's take a, uh, let's please do it. Uh, let's have a tea because that's a tradition in uh, Japan or in China. So the master uh, kept two cups on his uh, table and then he took the pot, teapot, and then he was pouring the tea. And then he was pouring the tea onto the cup of the student uh, until that it, uh, uh, that, uh, he, he put so much tea that it, it starts flowing, flowing out. And then the student said, master, what are you doing? Uh, the cup is full, just uh, stop, this is enough. And then the teacher said, uh, yes, I was trying to show you something that uh, when our minds are full with uh, prejudice, when, we are, when our minds are full with information that we have, no matter what we put novel, what we put uh, new, it doesn't stick there, it overflows. You know the story that it's very hard to teach something to someone who's uh, sort of uh, very adamant on the knowledge that he knows. He wouldn't listen, he wouldn't listen in an open manner. Now, as true as it may be, think of a humble person who's very open to ideas, who's very humble, even a person like that. Now, this is the deeper meaning of this same story. Uh, you know, as kids, we hear that uh, it's hard to teach something new for some for someone who's uh, quite uh, arrogant or adamant about uh, the knowledge he has. But think about this most humble person who can uh, uh, who's open to any idea. Even that person can only think about or interpret things based on what he knows. So no matter what you try to pour into his cup, the new knowledge it wouldn't uh, stay there because it would always overflow because we are bound by the knowledge we have. So that's a deeper meaning of this sense story. And uh, I have a fantastic example to show you how uh, bound you are, is that look around your room, you can never find something that you don't know. And why is that? We only see things that we know. We see a statue, we see a door. There's, there is no, there's nothing in this uh, room that you can't see, which you don't know. And suppose that even if there was something that you didn't know, you would still know it. Uh, I was discussing with a friend recently and what he was saying, saying is that uh, there's a circle, but he would like to say is that there's a universe of uh, things that uh, which could exist. And then there's a circle. That is the circle of our knowledge. That's a circle that we know. And uh, he was telling me that there could be items which are totally exclusive of our circle, which is outside of our circle. But then to really see that uh, in practical sense, we never find something which is totally outside our circle. We always find something which has an overlap with our circle. Let's take uh, 
a totally newly designed you know when uh, designers design things they come up with uh, fancy designs so they have these uh, fancy chairs but even a fancy chair which is totally unchair looking would uh, resemble a chair component in it. So it is not totally outside our circle of knowledge. It has an overlap in our circle of knowledge. So like this Zen master trying to tell the student that uh, you have so much knowledge, whether you like it or not, that you have gathered uh, through your uh, family, through your surroundings, through your education, all that knowledge, you cannot surpass that knowledge and your thoughts are bound by the amount of information and knowledge you have. So uh, that's one thing that we learned the other day. And another thing that we learned is that although uh, we think that we work with a free will, that sometimes, that sometimes we tend to uh, work quite habitually. In fact, you'll see that it's most of the time we work habitually. So, uh, if you see this image, it's an image of uh, Sri Lankan uh, devils. It's actually a very cultural thing. Uh, there are uh, these uh, rituals uh, where you have a overnight session where you dance off with the drums, the local drums and the uh, local music, uh, wearing these devil masks. And uh, there are 18 different types of devil masks that you wear. And uh, the story is that there are different characters. So they appear, they go, and the next one comes. So that's a story. Uh, but again, if you look at it, if you look at the story more holistically, you find that these are not different people. These are not different characters. But this is the same person having different characters, having different moods. Sometimes you are furious. Sometimes you are filled with rage. Sometimes you are very jealous. Sometimes you are very sarcastic. Sometimes you are very funny. Sometimes you, you are filled with lust. Uh, sometimes you are extremely uh, political. So you find all these uh, characteristics in one person. And this is the depiction of all these emotions a human could have uh, in this devil face masks. Uh, and why I want you to uh, bring this up is that don't we wear these masks every day at our work, at our, with, with our kids, uh, when we are at the, uh, uh, institutes when we are at the school, don't we wear these masks and act habitually? And when I, why I say we act habitually, uh, think of an example that uh, where you have to uh, grab a hot pan or a hot mug. The, the moment that you grab something really hot, your involuntary response would be to take your hand out and uh, uh, say that it's burning. This is very involuntary. But again, if you had a, if you could do this experiment later on without, of course, burning your hand, you will see that uh, the response that you have is not directly proportional to the sensation you get. What do I mean by that? I have seen uh, when when we don't uh, go out for biksha or when we don't get uh, uh, food uh, as arms from uh, people who come and donate food. Sometimes we have to cook, and when uh, when we are cooking. I see that uh, I have to touch the hot pan and move it from one uh, place to the other place. And uh, the natural reaction would be that you touch something really hot and take your hand out. But uh, if you are mindful about that, you find that uh, the sensation of hot and the reaction are not quite proportionate. Sometimes you just habitually do it. You just habitually, involuntarily take your hand away. And uh, uh, another way to look at it is that uh, when you touch from your fingers, you find it's really hot. But the same hot thing, a same hot uh, a chunk of rice, you can put it on your mouth and eat it. Now, it's quite uh, uh, counterintuitive because uh, we think that uh, the tongue and the mouth is more sensitive. But to see that the hand is more sensitive, is the hand more sensitive? Or are we habitually reacting to the senses of hand in a more uh, aggressive manner. Take a look at it. And also I remember an incident uh, about an year ago. I had to extract one of my uh, tooth. Uh, I had to pull it out. So I was telling the doctor, uh, doctor, I would like to do an experiment. Would you like to do it uh, without giving me anesthetics, uh, without uh, numbing my uh, gum? He said, uh, look, Sadhu, we can't do that. Although you would like to do your meditation, uh, pain meditation, I can't allow to do that. So I will give you a pain medication. So he numbed me and then he extracted my tooth. 
And then I said, doctor, uh, don't give me painkillers. He said, it's uh, unethical. I still am bound by the, uh, by the oath. So I will still have to give you. But then uh, uh, I said, uh, I, will not, uh, I will only take the antibiotics and I will not take the painkillers. So then I was not taking the painkillers. So after an hour or one and a half hours, uh, the anesthetic starts wearing off and then you feel the pain. What I actually wanted to look at is that uh, uh, sometimes you get quite uh, moody, you get quite irritated when you have a toothache because it's quite closer to your head. You feel quite irritated when you have an aching tooth. What I wanted to see is that when I talk to people, when I uh, meditate, when I uh, talk with other monks, when I uh, have an interaction with someone over the phone, does my toothache affect that conversation or does the toothache affect my mood? And uh, more and more I observe myself, I see that aching tooth is one thing, but your mood is totally a habit to your aching tooth. And I'm sure, especially for ladies, uh, because uh, compared to men, they, they come across uh, menstrual pains and, uh, you know, all these difficulties. And even if you are sick, when you have a fever or when you have a running nose, that you see that your mood changes, you are quite uh, snappy about it. So is this snappiness, is this uh, irritating feeling, is it really a uh, response to your pain or is it a habit that you have uh, learned over, over a period of time? I will also bring out another example. When you travel to Far East countries like Cambodia, China, uh, Philippines, you find that there are different types of uh, delicacies. For example, there's frog, there's a snake, there's uh, cockroaches, there's dog. So you find all these uh, different type of uh, meats that you wouldn't usually uh, consume. In Cambodia, uh, one, one time when I was there, I saw that there are uh, snakes who are on a stick. It's like a corn dog. It's like a corn dog. They, they sit on a stick. Uh, and people sell it. Uh, the street side vendors sell, uh, sell, sell the snake. And imagine that if you are served with a snake on a stick, right? Your immediate reaction would be quite... Uh, uh, if you are not a snake eater, by by uh, uh, if you are not a native snake eater, or if you're not very adventurous about your food, your natural reaction would be you will be filled with disgust, right? Is that really a habit or is it really the snake which is giving you the disgust? Why I'm saying that is because uh, sometimes uh, in some cultures, when you are used to that culture, it is a delicacy because uh, you want to eat the snake as a delicacy, right? But sometimes when you're not used to that, because you are not... Uh, uh, prepared or rather you are not uh, used to it is not your habit you attach disgust there so I want you to look at your experiences during the next week the responses we have are they habitual or are they really proportionate to the uh, sensual uh, perceptions that we get is it uh, proportionate to the uh, touch is it proportionate to the smell is it uh, proportionate to what we see or what we hear or if you look a little uh, deeper into your mind, is it proportionate to what you even feel? So having said that, so we discussed about how changed our, changed our minds, mind is, how changed our thoughts are, and then how habitual our thoughts are, how habitual our responses are. We also, start, uh, we also wanted to theorize it and uh, come up with this uh, theory, how it would work, how a habit would uh, come about. So habits don't, don't come uh, straight away. There's a way that a habit is formed. Uh, we have our sensory experiences. We have our learning from parents, society, uh, books and institutes, the more formal uh, ways of learning. And then uh, just because we learn something or just because, just because we come across an information uh, or a perception, we don't start uh, believing in it straight away. What we do is that we feel the emotion and uh, we rationalize it with the knowledge we have. Sometimes when you're especially young, you don't tend to rationalize, you just feel it. And if you somehow like it, you are just a believer of that uh, uh, habit or, or that uh, reaction. So again, looking at uh, eating cockroaches versus eating chicken. Uh, if you take a, 
a person from say Canada or Sri Lanka and put him in a country where they eat cockroaches. If the kid is uh, being sent to that country where at, a, at a quite young age, when he's grown up, he would have no problem eating cockroaches or snakes or dog. He will be totally fine with it. It's, it's as if he's eating uh, a piece of chicken, right? But uh, a, piece, a person who's eating chicken and assume that there's a culture where they, they hate chicken. Of course, we find that uh, sometimes in uh, halal meat, kosher meat, certain uh, animals are not uh, uh, included. Even in uh, Hindu-based uh, or even uh, Buddhist-based, we have, uh, we have uh, a restriction on eating certain meats. Like there's 10 meats that you are not ideally supposed to eat. And uh, a person who's living in that uh, culture for so long, it's odd for him to eat that meat. Say that uh, chicken is banned in your culture or in your religion, eating chicken would look so disgusting. I know this uh, because uh, my mother, uh, for uh, I think a religious purpose, she, she's a vegetarian. And uh, although she cooks meat uh, for us time to time, what she's uh, saying is that uh, when she eats meat, uh, she feels quite disgusted. It's almost as if, if she has a re gag reflex, like uh, she wants to throw up when she eats meat. So you see that sometimes these habits can uh, stay, it can get deeply rooted, and this is how the habits are made. And also, once we have a habit, we start acting unconsciously, without consciousness. We just follow the habit, uh, regardless of what, you, what the perception you get, what sensory input you get, you just follow the habit. You are designed. In a way, it's, it makes life easy because you don't have to think too much, and uh, you are habitual. Um, the next thing is that uh, when the habits are there, uh, we first start getting the stimulus. Let's say that uh, we hear music and then we have an emotion following that and then we have a reaction. Suppose that uh, you are locked down with your kids and uh, early in the morning, the kids start playing techno or club music like they have been to the Tomorrowland. So they start playing this music and you'll be so upset about it. Why do this kid play this uh, bouncy club electronic uh, music early in the morning? Why can't I listen to Beethoven or a nice symphony orchestra and Rio Bocelli? Why can't I listen to classic music? And uh, so the music is a stimulus you get. And the next to the hearing music, you get this emotion, which is quite uh, repulsive. And then you start uh, reacting uh, with, a, with an angry face, with an angry mind. Uh, you may even uh, use words. So that's how you uh, react to a habit. So we see how we react to our habits and uh, we see how habits are being formed. Also, we covered a bit, bit of ground on uh, why do people do what they really do? That they have different needs at each point of their, not chronological age, but uh, let's say a different type of an age. Uh, as you grow mature, your needs change. And uh, again, I'm not telling it in a bad sense, but for some people, uh, because they are probably... Uh, constraint of resources or that for some reason that they don't uh, pass a certain stage, they tend to stay in the same uh, stage until they perish away, right? So a normal person, if you take, when you're quite uh, young in your life, you have the physiological needs. Uh, you need, uh, let's say an early adult, early, uh, like a teen. Uh, it's about money. It's about uh, materialistic things. It's about uh, uh, how to gain uh, different different uh, materialistic possessions, etc. But then comes a time where it's not all about that. Uh, you want uh, belongingness. You want to be feeling loved. Uh, you want to feel uh, uh, belonging to a community. And then uh, more you grow, it's about the power. Like we were discussing those uh, uh, growing up people from stage to stage to stage. So it's about power. And uh, if you take in the uh, yoga philosophy, uh, they have uh, seven chakras and the first three are dedicated to these materialistic needs. And they say uh, you need to sort of uh, get saturated in each chakra to move on to the next level or to the move on to the next uh, chakra. When the root chakra is saturated, that is the time your next chakra will be open. So they call it chakra opening. But instead of uh, looking it at as, as an energy which is in your body, I really want you to vivid it as a state of mind. 
at each non chronological age that we have these different needs and uh, more we tend to mature we move from one need to the other so from very materialistic needs we sort of come into more spiritual looking needs self actualization looking needs we start uh, uh, getting habits or, or uh, becoming ourselves more benevolent we start acting ourselves uh, we start uh, we start accepting ourselves self acceptance compassion and then we start becoming more honest when i say honest not in a general sense but in in terms of our self self expression we start becoming about uh, truly expressing what we truly believe in order to say what we truly believe we need to look inwards and see what we truly believe otherwise you are just uh, saying something that you think that you believe which could not be the real case but if you look deep inside you will see that uh, to do a real self expression or to be really honest you need to see inwards that's only when you can say honestly what you truly believe and then you also start developing this habit of uh, looking inwards mindfully you start becoming aware of your own uh, chained thoughts or thought chains or how you react to habits or how these habits are formed and beyond that they say that uh, beyond this uh, uh, initial three parts of the non materialistic chakras the last one is totally wisdom it's not even in your body it's outside your body so that's what the <clears throat> yogic schools tells us uh, but we learn that uh, at each part of our life we act differently uh, to the uh, to our drives so our drives are different and then uh, let me draw your mind that uh, i was asking the lockdown taught you what what is your true purpose of existence or at least it uh, gave you a pause it hit that pause button and said take a break from your rat race and see what is really needed what is the true purpose of your existence then you might found you, you might have come across that uh, we have this uh, different stages of our life like uh, maslow said uh, physiological uh, power love etc etc we are trying to gain something we are trying to feel something we are trying to make our cup full make ourselves ourselves fulfilled although that everyone's dream is to uh, fulfill ourselves that you will see that no matter uh, how much we try to fulfill ourselves the grass is always green on the other side we want the thing that we don't have for example 2019 you wanted annual leave not for two weeks for two months and in 2020 you got annual leave for two months but now you want to work so much so that you want to work from home so you see you always want that thing that you don't have and why is that why do we see, see why do we feel that we are so unfulfilled and we are in a continuous uh, search to fill ourselves to fill our cup and uh, why is that we can't uh, simply rest in peace now how can a person rest in peace the only way a person can rest in peace is uh, when he is done with his plans when he has no uh, nothing for him to seek for he can rest in peace but can we really rest in peace because our urges are so much even uh, when we have a fantastic uh, annual vacation which is lockdown we can't enjoy that we want to look for things that we can't get and if you if you all of a sudden uh, 2021 if uh, everyone is put on a uh, office environment again you will start complaining i need leave now so you always uh, try to look for the thing that you do not have and uh, just observe this pattern and this has been the pattern ever since right so let's uh, look at this uh, people our previous people who have been growing up uh, i would also like to show you another aspect uh, when we are growing up now if you look at the amount of uh, money that you need to spend at each part of your life to be satisfied when you are a kid when you are a teenager when you are an adult the amount of money if you draw it in one axis and then uh, also you draw the age on another axis you will find that the amount of money that you are spending is something like that for the same amount of uh, 
happiness for the same amount of pleasure when you grow up you have to spend more and more for example if you are an adult now to uh, to buy a car you would have to spend so much a few thousand dollars a few million rupees in sri lanka but you see when you are a kid you don't need to spend money you only need a, a box of matches i remember when i was young a, a box of matches or a, a, or some item can become a plane it can become a rocket it can become a car so i'm satisfied so i would enjoy the box of matches more than i enjoy a bmw right now right so you see that the more you grow the cost you have to incur increases and uh, you might think that uh, when you grow older like when you are really old it might decrease actually it does not when you are in your mid life you spend on recreational drugs and uh, more you grow older you start spending on uh, medical drugs so it still keeps going up so uh, you see that it's uh, it's quite sad that we have to spend more and more to get the same amount of happiness and uh, now what is happiness again or or what is the mechanism of this happiness you would see that uh, we have urges we have desires and uh, trying to fulfill would uh, would be called as an urge trying to fulfill something is called the urge or the desire achieving the desire gives us pleasure now what's the connection trying to or wanting to fulfill is urge and achieving the urge or achieving the desire is pleasure now this pleasure every time you get the pleasure it makes the desire much stronger you want to do it again and again and uh, from just having a very uh, small wanting or a, or a very a light thought of wanting uh, you go and achieve it and then you want it more again the next time so the desires and uh, the pleasure you get are sort of in a chicken and egg situation right which comes first is it the pleasure or is it the desire but we see that desire and pleasure are quite interlinked we don't know which came first uh, the chicken or the egg but desires gives us pleasure or attaining uh, fulfilling our desires gives us pleasure and that pleasure itself makes us wanting more and more things it's like a vicious cycle from uh, being very light you become very attached uh, again if you look at a kid right a kid recently last year uh, just before the first lockdown of corona i uh, there was a funeral um, some friends of this temple uh, they had uh, the, that family had uh, two kids the youngest kid was about 1 year old the second one was about 2 years old the father passed away uh and uh, we went for the final uh, rituals of that uh, person who passed away just before the lockdown and to see that the youngest kid he was just playing under the coffin he had no attachment even to his father's death but more and more you grow in your life you will see that you get so attached to your loved ones uh, you get so attached that uh, it will be very hard for you to absorb right so you see that uh, from a simple drive of fulfillment something can uh, become a very deep urge uh, even though it gives pleasure that pleasure itself wants to wants us to uh, fulfill that even more and more so from being very light like that kid who had no attachment you would become an adult who's very attached right so that's one nature of our attachment or or, or rather our pleasure let's look at another look at it from another point of view you probably have seen this that uh, there's this curve called the bell curve in fact this curve you see everywhere the waxing and the waning of the moon right uh, the high tide and the low tide sunlight now it's uh, early morning in sri lanka i see the uh, sun coming out and it will be hot it will be quite at a high point and then it, it will go down and then it will be the night so you see this uh, pattern everywhere be it in your mind be it in the outside world uh, anywhere you find this natural uh, phenomena of the bell curve now the bell curve has a beginning has an ascent has a descent and an end to it or rather a change instead of saying an end we could even call it a change 
things don't really end they just change to a different form if you look at your urge your urge also follows the same pattern uh, although you think that uh, when you have a drive uh, which gives you pleasure and you get pleasure by attaining that drive it gives uh, uh, even a bigger urge to uh, achieve that although you think that it's cyclically uh, uh, endlessly going up you see that is not the case all the time sometimes there's a natural end to the urge right so i remember the time that uh, when i was young during the uh, during uh, my high school we had this exam and uh, i would uh, i'm generally uh, not a very studious person i don't like uh, studying per se but i like reading books i like reading uh, literature and then i uh, found that uh, there's so limited time with your work at school uh, the time that you are you have to read your books and all of a sudden uh, after my exams i found all the time in the world and uh, all the books in the world i mean uh, there was a lot of uh, access to the books but to see that my urge has gone down when i have it it has uh, gone away i don't uh, i i didn't want to read books anymore i want to do something else so my urge came to a natural end and if you take a relationship you would find that there's a uh, during the infatuation you are quite infatuated it's it's uh, probably the best period that you can have and then it reaches this plateau and uh, usually it goes down but we don't want to uh, don't we don't want to on that feeling to go down we want to flatten the curve like we did with corona we want to elongate it we want to keep going and that's the very nature of a person of of a being is that we want to live we want to hang on and something which is uh, different which makes a lay person different from a monk would be that a monk does not wish to hang on again don't misunderstand when i say a monk does not wish to hang on to life it doesn't mean that he is suicidal that he is so upset that he is suicidal and he wants to uh, let go of everything that's not the way to look at it let me uh, explain to you further so instead of trying to flattening a curve we try to uh, sort of accept the curve as it is and i will show you i will give you a few examples of uh, how this happens uh, really and how this natural urge ends uh, i don't know if you know these people here so on the left you have avici who's a famous dj uh, who committed suicide in 2018 and then on the right you find uh, james packer who's a business tycoon from australia who owns a lot of casinos and a lot of resorts etc so say avici in his life at a very young age he has been very fortunate to get all the money that uh, anyone could dream of and all the love that anyone could dream of love from his fans love his love a lot of people loved avici and uh, all the fame that a person can could, could uh, think of so when he has gotten everything uh, there's even a documentaries that you can uh, look into uh, that avici has become so upset about his existence he found that it it to be quite uh, problematic he ended his life and same with james packer he got everything he wanted uh, love the basic needs uh, the money career the power everything and then he announced that i'm going to step down because i'm depressed so you see that sometimes when you start getting things you you don't know how to hang on to life but some people like this bill gates and elon musk they know how to hang on to life and let's see how they hang on to their lives bill and melinda they're quite very nice people quite benevolent people they created this trust basically uh, to eradicate hunger or eradicate power from the world elon musk on the other hand he wanted Uh, to save the civilization and put a colony colony in mars now both of these things are very fantastic things a person could do but you also see compared to avici or james packer their targets are so ahead you can't uh, you can't eradicate hunger or poverty in the world in a lifetime in fact i don't know anyone could uh, ever eradicate it of course it's not very nice uh, to try for it and uh, elon musk i don't know if he would succeed in his uh, Uh, vision to colonize mars during his lifetime because life could end the next minute even if it doesn't even uh, uh, the 50 years he have or 30 years he have 
I don't know if it's possible. But this is how if you want to stay in this world, you keep existing. You hang on to something which is too far-fetched, too far away. And then you hang on to that feeling and uh, you carry on like that. So again, in summary, when you have an urge, you work as if there's nothing else matters. It's all about that urge. But you see that these urges, these desires, they are quite relative. They change with your age. What was uh, mattering the most? Like, for example, when, when I was young, all what mattered to me as a kid was playing outside in the hot sun. And there came, an age, there came, came an age that uh, all what mattered for me was my career. So the amount of energy that you hang on to, uh, sacrificing everything you have, right? It just changes. And you could see that sometimes you love a person so much. A lot of people come and say that uh, um, I have been loving my uh, uh, first wife a lot. And then uh, he's coming to me about the problem of the second wife, right? So when the time that you are infatuated and when you loved your first wife a lot, uh, you would do anything for her. But you see, uh, it, it falls into this natural curve. Your uh, relationship hits this plateau and then it starts uh, waning off, deteriorating, and then you find a new one. And then the, all the things that you sacrificed, everything that you did during the first period becomes null and void. So you see that these desires are very relative. They change with age, uh, they change with environment. For example, your habits change drastically with your environment. If someone comes to the temple, they would have all of a sudden a very calm mind. And when they go to a party, they would have a very uh, funky mind. And when they go to a tensed office, they would have a very tensed mind. So the mind or the desire or the habit changes with the environment. It changes with the time of the day. Now, now what is uh, uh, nice in the morning is not so nice in the evening, right? And uh, Overall, throughout our lives, the only thing that we can see is this continuous change of our desires. But what we fail to understand is that when a desire is happening, uh, we just hang on to it so tight, uh, like uh, you know, in a game of tug of war. If you hang on too tight, if you are so tightly, uh, if you have clenched your fist so, so tightly, if you are grabbing to the rope too tight, and if the rope has been uh, uh, taken away, if it's pulled from the other side, you can get a burn. So tighter you are attached to your rope, more burns you would have. And uh, in Sri Lanka, we have coconut trees. And if someone tried uh, climbing a coconut tree, you would find that uh, after climbing about a few feet, uh, you could slide down. And if you hang on too tight to the coconut tree, you would have a abrasive burn. If you don't hang on too tightly, you would just slide down. So more you tend to hang on to your desires, the abrasive wound it would leave will also be higher. And uh, all these desires, aren't they like uh, clouds at sea on a beautiful evening? There are clouds looking like dinosaurs, looking like swans, all types of different images. And we hang on to these cl clouds so much and when they disappear, we cry. Like those kids who are building a sandcastle, a beautiful sandcastle in the, in the beach, on the beach, and when they get washed away, they cry. Our mind is like a canvas where we can paint using any color. So from the, day, from the time that we have woken up, we create these uh, mental images using different colors. And these colors, because of the very nature of our mind, they get blotted away, they get washed away, and the canvas gets refreshed, right? Uh, so we don't realize that it's like a fish trying to draw something on the water. We don't realize that uh, it's, it's uh, going to eventually disappear. We hang on to that. And all these desires which you are hanging on to, which, should also, which could also hurt you. Uh, so I, I, I was telling you that uh, I was at one point of my life was quite into this wonderful sport, sport called surfing. And it's a, it's a quite meditative sport. Because uh, in order to do surfing, you have to uh, drive so far away, few hours, and then you have to go to the shore, and then you have to swim to the uh, swell, 
you need to uh, swim uh, to the swell and then you have to wait for the swell you need to wait for that wave to catch the wave you need to wait for the wave and uh, so you wait for 10 minutes you may wait for 20 minutes depending on the wave pattern and eventually you find the wave and then you if you can catch the wave you start surfing if you can't you just struggle and for that very brief moment when you are on top of the wave you are just with yourself that's why i said it's very uh, uh, meditational surfing is very meditational so is any sport or any uh, activity that you we do with uh, that type of an awareness or a concentration it makes you one with your experience usually we are not one with our experience we have an experience but our mind is wandering either in the future or in the past we are not usually in the present but these type of experiences uh, aligns you your experiences uh, to the present so with the waves what i have learned is that if you if you have gone to the beach and stayed on a surfboard you will see that sometimes the waves come and the waves go and if you don't try too hard to catch the wave the wave will just pass right if you are on a boat uh, if you if you have noticed the waves on the ocean waves don't take you anywhere it's the current which takes you somewhere current drags you somewhere but the wave does not wave comes uh, you would go up and you would go down the wave passes that's how the waves work but the currents would drag you to uh, whichever the direction that the current wants to drag you so our desires and they like these waves in the ocean they come and they go the person who doesn't know this nature of my, our mind try to hang on to this wave and try to catch the wave and uh, if you are a surfer you know how hard it is to catch the wave you need to swim vigorously in order to catch the wave you need to match your speed with the speed of the wave that's how you catch a wave so with these desires that you hang on to sometimes you are unable to catch them you know it's relatively easy to catch a wave in the ocean but our desires are like really trying to catch wind they just flow away and we are trying to catch them and when we can't catch them we feel so unsatisfied so unfulfilled so hard broken again now don't uh, misunderstand uh, what i'm trying to say also try to read between the lines the underlying message that i'm trying to say i'm not uh, for the for the very nature of it i can't tell you the message straight away but it's more of a encrypted like i'm talking in crypt i'm i'm, I'm using a cryptic language uh, all these examples that i'm giving i'm trying to communicate something but i cannot communicate it to you directly like uh, 1 plus 1 is 2 which is very apparent i can't communicate it to you like directly but you don't have to understand what i'm saying you just only have to listen right without prejudice don't reject it don't accept it just listen and see if there's any transformation especially with related to this uh, lockdown related issues that we have so uh, we were trying to catch waves also you would see that uh, you start catching waves and then you can't catch them sometimes sometimes you can catch them and it uh, increases your desire and urge so you want to catch a bigger wave like a drug addict who starts with a entry level drug and keeps on advancing on his drugs so you start with something and then you go to more sophisticated more harmful drugs and each time you upgrade the cost increases so uh, like with the age every time you upgrade you try to upgrade your happiness you see that you are spending more in order to get the same happiness you had to you have to spend more now when i say spend it is not only in terms of money in terms of energy in terms of time to get the same happiness you have to invest more so your return on the investment uh, goes down actually the returns on the investment goes down over a period of time and over a course of a desire there's another solution for urges if you really want to control an urge there's another way that is a distraction you can distract yourself and uh, control your urges how you could do that is uh, uh, now again if you are used to eating three meals a day and if you want to somehow reduce your uh, meal intake or if you want to go on a intermittent fasting you would see that sometimes you need to control your hunger and what's the easiest way to control your hunger is to dis- distract yourself is to postpone 
right? You will see sometimes that uh, when you are really busy, when you are uh, facing a big issue at your office or big issue at your uh, house and your household, or if you are having a heart heartbreak, if you have a broken heart, you tend to uh, forget your meals. And where's that hunger which existed? So sometimes hunger is so irritating, it's so urging, it gives you this irritation and you're hungry and you are even, uh, um, you know, taking it out, venting it out on the other people around you. So I'm referring this hunger to all the urges in your mind. And all these examples that I was talking, don't take them literally. Take the uh, idea that I'm trying to communicate. That's why I said, take the underlying text, of, uh, try to grab that underlying text, but not the metaphor uh, in a literal sense. So hunger can be distracted. You will also notice that uh, I'm talking about uh, different phenomena that we see around the world, uh, see in our existence. But actually, I'm talking about our mind, the patterns in our mind, waxing and waning, natural end, habits, how we respond, how we create a habit, uh, how limited our thinking is. These are all properties of our mind. I'm not trying to tell anything else than properties of our own mind. I don't know if you have seen these images before. This is called a mandala. Mandala is an ancient form of uh, art which you find in uh, Tibet or which you find in uh, northern India. Like if you go to Dharmashala or Manali or Rishikesh, you will find these type of arts. And uh, what does a mandala represent? So you see that there's a, a demon who's uh, holding this chakra of samsara or the wheel of existence of a person. And uh, what is depicted, if I uh, explain what is depicted here, is that uh, they say that uh, the universe consists of uh, different realms, a realm of heaven, a realm of human existence, and uh, more realms of uh, sort of darkness. When I say darkness, the animal realm, the, uh, where the evil spirits live, etc., etc. And you see that in heaven, it's all about ecstasy. It's about being joyful. And uh, the other hells or the other negative uh, worlds, or the negative realms, they are, one is about cravings. And there's another realm which is of total agony. You only find agony there. And there's another uh, realm which is all about uh, your survival, your self-preservation. It's all about that. Like a, like a squirrel. Uh, you know, we have uh, a place where a lot of uh, birds and squirrels gather. And we also have a cat. So I see when I look at these uh, birds, it's all about survival for them. They don't even enjoy their meal peacefully. It's all about survival. And there's another realm, which is all about jealousy. It's all about jealousy. So in this particular mandala, the, the demon is holding this uh, chakra or the wheel of samsara using his two arms, two limbs and the mouth. And uh, the way that uh, they depict this is that uh, this is not about different realms. Also, it could, uh, uh, it could be a, a realm in the sense, uh, something physical, which is in existence. But what I want you to think of it this again, like the same way that we thought about chakra of uh, yogic uh, practice, is that uh, instead of looking at this as uh, uh, different realms, but if you look at it as uh, states of your mind, sometimes you have this extreme joy, the ecstasy. Sometimes being human, you have the purpose. I forgot to mention the property of the human realm is purpose. You look for what is beyond, right? And uh, all the other realms, the darker realms, they have cravings, they have agony, survival, self-preservation, jealousy, rage, you know, all these type of uh, heavy feeling. And the two arms, two limbs and the mouth are the five senses. And uh, within these five senses, this is the way that your mind works. So they say that uh, if you are an enlightened being, you will be placed outside these realms of life or the wheel of samsara, wheel of existence. Uh, so you find people who are, who are outside residing in these uh, pictures. When I talk about mandala, there's another uh, form of mandala like this. Uh, it looks like a beautiful pattern. But uh, what does this pattern really tries to tell us? 
you see that there's a uh, there's so many rings layers into that so there's an outer ring which is purple and there's a blue ring there's a green ring etc etc so what if we take these small circles and the, i'm talking about the purple uh, circle and the small white dots around it can we depict it as our natural urges so it starts small the white ring around the uh, purple circle it starts growing and then it wanes off it uh, gets washed away and then you switch to the next urge right it's a natural birth of a of a new desire and it uh, grows up it maximizes it comes to its highest point and then it starts going down right so what we usually do in our usual life is we move from one uh, desire one urge to the other urge so we keep moving so that's how one could spend his entire life moving from one one uh, desire to the other desire that's how you could keep going but sometimes you find that instead of moving horizontally you can also move upward like uh, from being very materialistic you can start becoming more uh, spiritually oriented more uh, self actualization oriented so you can move up and down like that also so um, i could also say that you could move from uh, some of the lower emotions or low vibrating emotions to more purely vibrating emotion emotions and uh, in fact uh, the mandalas are, are depicted that that uh, there are demon like behaviors when i say demon like they are the jealousy uh, furious those are the demon like behaviors and there are the angel like behaviors compassionate benevolent kind and there are brahma like emotions now what is a brahma brahma uh, you could equate it to a god or you could even uh, call a sage a brahma or you can call it a wise person a wise spiritual person person now what's the uh what's the difference of a brahma that he is very uh equanimous he is very neutral considers about equanimity it's not about being uh, tossed away to greed or aversion he is more neutral to things now this neutrality could come of course because you are too lazy or because uh, you want to be avoidant you know you could also want to withdraw from your life you can go and seek refuge in some isolated spot that is also another way to be neutral but then again you see that uh, no matter where you go you cannot seek refuge from your own mind you cannot you can withdraw from uh, the society often times people ask me uh, sadhu is your purpose withdrawing from the daily grind of your life and uh, detaching from the society it's not the answer to that it's not uh, what i'm doing i'm not uh, trying to hide away from the society i'm just uh, trying to understand my mind and uh, go into a different different realm inside my mind because no matter where you go assume that you went to the most isolated place still you will be not free from your own realms you can be furious you can be agitated uh, you can be lustful all these uh, hard emotions will be bothering you but then why i say these emotions are hard what is more peaceful to you is the moment that you are so desirous to get something that moment where you have a lot of urge is that the more peaceful thing or is that the moment where you just look at the sun look at the ocean uh, look at a uh, fly look at a bee is that the more peaceful moment is the peace lies in this equanimity neutrality or does the peace life lies in this uh, greed or the aversion in fact aversion is a little uh, stronger than uh, or, or rather fury is a stronger emotion than lust lust is soft it's nice it's nicer but uh, anger is not nice no one want to live their lives in anger or in fury or in rage but people would like to live their lives in uh, desire like in uh, lust right but uh, if you see a realm of your mind which you have never seen before of this uh, neutrality of this peace you would start loving this but mind you again if you start loving this you will be still inside this wheel of samsara the wheel of existence so how do we really go outside this 
Now, uh, the depiction of this uh, mandala is that uh, the only way to move forward is uh, go from one ring to the other ring. So from the purple ring, you move to the blue ring and the white ring until you find that there are no more rings left, that you are not walking on a horizontal path, but you are moving upwards. And you would come to this one central point where there is no existence. Now, why do I say that? In a circle, you can find the area under the circle, but you can find the area on a dot. When I say dot, even if we draw a dot, it would be a circle. I mean, it would be the diameter of the pen that we are trying to use or the pencil that we are trying to use. But if you think of a dot, which is by definition, it's a dot, a single point. There's no existence in a single point. We can only think about it, but if you really see a dot, you can't see a dot. <laughs> now that looks like an oxymoron, what does that mean? Anyway, let's uh, hold on to that thought again. Instead of moving in circles, instead of moving in uh, uh, distractions, right? We, we talked about if we want to con uh, control an urge, we can distract. But by distracting, it would be like you're moving from uh, one purple ring to another purple ring. Even if you don't distract, you would eventually move on. What you liked uh, when you were young, you would move on to a different thing when you grow older. So instead of doing that, you move into a different uh, circle entirely. From being more demon-like, you become more angel-like. From becoming more angel-like, you become more Brahma-like, right? So that's one way to look at it. But the other way to look at it is that, or the other way to find out is, is by really using this, Pratyaveksha. Now I was trying to find a, a English word for Pratyaveksha, which I couldn't find. So if you Google it, you would find things like uh, reflect or retrospect. But I don't think that uh, explains Pratyaveksha uh, to a great extent. So Pratyaveksha is not really about uh, retrospecting or reflecting uh, on things. Pratyaveksha is about, now, if we take the words Pratya and Veksha, Pratya literally means food. But uh, when you say food, it's more fuel, like uh, a food is needed for our existence and uh, food is needed for thought, food for thought, right? So Pratya is really the input and Veksha, Vekshana means in Sanskrit that you are in search for something. You are looking for something. So what you're really doing is you are looking at uh, as an observer, as an unbiased, unbiased non-judgmental observer, you're looking at things as it is and you're looking at what fools them, what fools your thought, what fools your habit, what fools your boredom, what fools your rage. Again, why am I telling you all these things? Like instead of, uh, now when we first came to this discussion, I was supposed to help you with the, issues with regard to corona lockdown, COVID lockdown. But instead of doing that, I'm talking gibberish. I'm talking about mind, I'm talking about habit. Like I told you the first day, if I'm a doctor, I could give you a tablet so that you would take it, you take a paracetamol and you, uh, your, your headache is gone. But I could teach you medicine. And I would like to, instead of giving you a tablet, I would really like you to teach medicine so that you can self heal. So that's why I mentioned on the first day that there's a uh, body related therapy that we are talking about. There's a therapeutic narrative, a story that you can think to console yourself. Oh, but I eventually want you to understand or oh, the underlying uh, message of this uh, entire uh, series is to become more self-aware, right? So uh, Pratyaveksha is something that you could do now, what is Pratyaveksha? Now, for example, uh, as monks, uh, we have to chant this uh, thing uh, before we take our meals called the Pratyaveksha chanting. And what we do is that uh, when we eat and we keep on eating, uh, we look at it as it is, non-judgmentally. Are we eating this food because our body needs for our existence or are we eating it out of greed? Now, it doesn't say if you are eating it out of greed, stop immediately and then... Uh, uh, stop eating. It's, it's not the point. The point is to observe. Know that you are greed. Or are you eating with uh, rep repulsion? Are, are you, are you, uh, do you uh, not like this food? You don't eat that food with uh, love. You eat it with rejection. 
is that a, a curry that you don't like? Right? Or is it a curry that you like so much that your mom cooked? And when you see the curry, you find that emotion next to it, the warmth of the mother and how uh, she fed you and all that. Now we are looking at how your mind works, the pratyaveksha, how things work in a very atomic level, right? Instead of uh, looking at things superficially, uh, you are looking at uh, things in an atomic level. So I could also tell you something that uh, you can do the same thing during the next week and uh, share your experience with me. Uh, about how you uh, do things, how you crave for food, how you crave for an addiction, for, a, for alcohol, right? Uh, all you have to do is just observe, not observe forcefully. If you remember it, just observe. If you don't remember it, don't just uh, forcefully observe. We'll get to this uh, at a later point of our discussion about uh, mindfulness. But all what you need to do is observe your craving, observe your addiction. Right, and if you take uh, an addiction like uh, alcohol, say so. If you are familiar, if you have been uh, consuming alcohol, you would know. Otherwise, uh, for the sake of uh, uh, doing this experiment, don't try to get into that habit. Uh, if you are already in that habit, observe that uh, there are different types of drugs. There are drugs which are inhibitors, stimulants, hallucinogen hallucinogens. So, what an inhibitor does it? It inhibits your feelings. It inhibits your fear. It inhibits your motor function. And there are stimulants which uh, enhances, it uh, amplifies. And there are hallucinogens, hallucinogens, which totally gives you a totally different picture. Right? So there are different types of drugs. And alcohol happen to be in the category of inhibiting. So it inhibits your motor function. You can't walk properly. It inhibits your feelings sometimes, like fear, uh, scariness. So in Sri Lanka, they say that uh, uh, you know people are uh, primarily speaking Sinhala or Tamil. but uh, when they when they are drunk, they start speaking in English. They do not have that shyness. They can go up on the stage and do the karaoke. So uh, it inhibits your feelings, right? So if you look at your if you are addicted to alcohol per se, and if you look at uh, what makes you happy when you consume that drug, if you look in closely in that atomic level, right? If you look into this atomic level of pratyaveksha, what is really happening? you will see that uh, it's always not about uh, getting high. Now, what is getting high, right? Uh, when you consume alcohol, it's with that uh, people that you like to hang out with. It's the company. Oh, sometimes you attach this happiness to the sleepiness or the drowsiness because it is uh, a little relaxing. It's like you're on a, uh, on a drug drug as in uh, on a drug uh, after, right after uh, right after you take a surgery, you feel that you are quiet in a relaxed position where you don't have the sensation of your body, you're relaxed. So are you attaching your happiness to that relaxation, right? Or is it the taste? Is it the smell? Is it the bubbles? What exactly are you attached to? Now, if you can uh, look at your addiction and if you can look closer, if you can magnify, in the atomic level, what exact component are you addicted to? Is it the company? Is it the uh, feeling of uh, drowsiness, the detachment from your body? Is it the taste, the smell, the, the environment, the ambience? What is it? So I want you to uh, look into these things uh, and share with me. Unfortunately, we don't have time today also to uh, do a Q&A. So look into these aspects of your life and see what exactly causes your desire or your natural compulsive urge? And uh, why this compulsive urge, this compulsiveness, this urge, this uncontrollable desire is what will not allow you to rest in peace or stay freely during a lockdown period. Because you are so eager, you want to achieve what is not here now. You want to go to the next thing. Again, I'm not trying to say it in a bad way. I'm trying to say it as part of our lives. It's not nothing uh, unnatural. And again, what I uh, don't want to do is, I don't want you to uh, do something else. By uh, thinking about this, I don't want you to do something else. Uh, all I want you to do is look at things more internally. Try to internalize your existence. All this time, 
uh, before corona you were trying to externalize it now try to internalize your existence and also another thing you could do you can start loving your own shadow right now what i mean by your own shadow is start loving to be with yourself now from the day that you are born to the day that you die uh, there are two monks in the, in our temple who are twins now they shared the same womb for nine months and they came out and they are monks together and in the same temple it seems like they are they are together all the time but to see uh, if you really ask them they are two different people and each person has only lived with himself for his entire existence he hasn't lived with someone else we feel like we are living with someone else but really we are only living with ourselves and we do not know this and we consider being ourselves uh, a bad thing that's why you don't like lockdown you don't want to be with yourself so until you start loving yourself until you start accepting yourself you will be afraid of this shadow as if you see a ghost right so shadow is a ghost to you right now the one thing that you are most afraid is right now is to be with yourself to be with your own feelings with your own habits with own uh, chain of thoughts with your own uh, fool which uh, fools these thoughts right so make use of this lockdown take take time to uh, make use of this lockdown in order to understand yourself and to love yourself and be with yourself so with that we'll conclude the discussion for today and also uh, through this discussion you can get into a lot of misunderstanding now why i say misunderstanding is that uh, whatever i say is very biased i can only show you one aspect of or aspect of our life for example i was trying to uh, sort of uh, repel you away from uh, desire right but when i try to repel you away from desire you start becoming more averse to desire instead of uh, uh, being neutral you start becoming more averse so we we like a pendulum swing between these desires and aversions and that was the first word uh, or the first thing that buddha when he got enlightened and when he first met his uh, first disciples that's the first thing uh, that he said there are two states of mind desire wanting or aversion rejection either you want to accept it or you want to reject it and we swing between those two states right and uh, we don't know what we really want to uh, what we really have is it aversion or desire but under underneath all your uh, skin underneath your mind underneath your mind underneath your superficial mind there's a big engine working which we are still not aware of so all i'm asking you is to be with yourself use this time uh, that you got with corona and internalize your feelings right so with that we will uh, end the discussion for today and uh, we will look at uh, how the other issues like uncertainty boredom uh, or, or uncertainty the fear of uh, death fear of uh, losing jobs fear of losing uh, uh, our normal way of life and all these uncertainties and the fears related to covid right we we'll look at how a monk would approach these questions or these issues so today we looked at the uh, urge related part for the first two days and then we'll move on to the more fear related parts and how what's the experience of a monk uh, to fight this lockdown issue or if monk sees a lockdown as a problem or if a monk sees lockdown as a playground where we, he can be with himself uh, so that is the formal end of today's discussion may all beings find your eternal bliss